Hello, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Pablo. Um, when I de decided to, uh, de to submit a talk to, to PyCon today, I started thinking what might be a fun, uh, at least for me, a topic to talk about today. And one of the things I really enjoy to do is uh, learn new programming languages. And throughout my career, I, I discovered that the, this process uh, of learning new languages is not only very, very enjoyable and fun, and, and at least for me, but it's also very, uh, very useful as it gives you new perspectives and, and techniques that you can then apply in, in your main language or day-to-day -day language. So um, this is um, this is what we're going to talk about today: how, how you can leverage Rust in order to improve certain aspects of Python. So uh, before we begin, a uh, brief talk, a uh, brief intro about uh, what we do at Twist Bioscience, just for you to, to have some context. So at Twist, we make DNA. The, imagine you have a 3D printer that instead of outputting a, a plastic uh, model, you will get DNA molecules. So our customers take this uh, DNA and they use it to develop uh, food and drugs and uh, applied materials, all sorts of uh, uh, very amazing stuff, incredible stuff, really. And uh, by the way, uh, later on today, our uh, general manager here in Israel is going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we do at Twist here in Israel. So I think you should check it out. It's really, it's really interesting. So in order to make DNA, we need to be able to take the sequence uh, from our customers, the sequence being the four-letter codes that you are familiar with, ACTG. And we are also need to be able to give feedback fast online back to our customers on those sequences. So feedback such as um, manufacturing complexity, uh, pricing cost, uh, manufacturing time, with the, the time is going to take us to actually produce that uh, that DNA. So as a software engineer, that, that is one of the challenges we we face in our development team. We had a Python library that uh, implements some of the algorithms required in order to give that feedback on, on the DNA sequences. And this library is used both by uh, my, the team I work for uh, on a web services and also by other teams within the company that use it, use the library directly. So uh, usually um, Python is fast enough for, for our needs, but in this particular case, it, it, it wasn't up to, to standard. So eventually we can uh, became a bottleneck uh, for our pipeline. We did try to optimize it, and the results were not really very satisfactory, and we ended up with quite a complicated uh, code base. So another thing was that we couldn't just port this code to a different language, as most of the, sci uh, the, the users in, other, in the other teams in the company are scientists, bi biologists, that uh, really are familiar uh, with Python. So uh, this is when we started considering uh, the option of, of writing uh, a Python extension. So for those of you who are not familiar of, with this concept, uh, Python extension is basically code that you write in compiled languages and then you import them into uh, Python scripts. So typically you do this in C or C++. The, the problem with this is that uh, this requires for you to have, uh, to have knowledge on how to deal with the low-level details of concurrency and memory management in C, which was knowledge that we didn't really have in the team. And on top of that, I, I really don't trust myself writing C or C++ code as you can really shoot yourself in the foot if, if, you're not, if you're not aware of what you're doing, if you don't have any experience or practice. So we knew we could speed up our algorithm uh, with a Python extension, but we lack the proper knowledge in C or C++ to do so. So this is 
when we started considering uh, Rust. So uh, Rust is a system level programming language uh, with uh, zero cost abstractions. It was developed at the Mozilla in order to, um, the main idea was to have the, the new, en the, the rendering engine of the, the Firefox uh, browser developed in, in Rust, which is, uh, is in production in the last uh, uh, versions. It is a very fast language. Uh, it is almost uh, as fast as C or C++, and it has very novel ideas on concurrency. It is a very secure language. The, the Rust compiler, the, the Rust language, guarantees memory safety, and this is very important as you, uh, as you are ass assured that you are guaranteed that you're going to be prevented crashes in production and uh, memory exploits, such as uh, buffer overruns and stuff like that. Very scary stuff. So it is also very productive. It's a high-level language. Uh, you might say it's, it's as productive as Python. It's not, as, it's, it's not the same level, but uh, it gets uh, close enough. Uh, it has a very modern toolset tool that helps it do it uh, uh, productive. Uh, you have a car uh, the package manager, which is called Cargo a very modern tool uh, to install the packages and, and build the, 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 the libraries. You have an utility called Rust App, which is very, very similar to PyEnv, uh, what we have in Python, and it helps you manage different uh, versions of Rust. It has an amazing IDE, IDE integration, uh, code formatting, so all the tools that uh, we really enjoy as, as software developers. One thing that I experienced and I really like about Rust is that the compiler is really uh, your friend. You don't need to fight all the time. Uh, you don't need to fight it. I, in my experience with the compiled languages, you really, uh, I, I experienced that uh, with the, you, you sometimes don't understand the, the, the messages from the, the compiler, so you need to you start fighting it a little bit to, to know uh, what to do, what to do next. So Rust compiler is very helpful, nice warnings, and it's also very fast. So it is a, an, a very nice experience. And also the, the building process is, uh, uh, is run on top of a very modern uh, tool chain that makes it uh, very easy to build uh, packages. It is a flexible language. I mean, even, even though it's classified as a system level programming uh, language, uh, every people is using it for all sorts of things, domains like uh, web servers, uh, command line uh, applications. Uh, it, it is used in embedded system. So it's very, very flexible. And Rust is also very empowering. Empowering in the sense that if you're a, a newcomer to system programming, it really lowers the barrier of entry and allows you to, to do things that, uh, for example, myself is a, a web development background and I, I was able to do system level programming with confidence because the, the language uh, gives you certain guarantees and safety. And it's also empowering for experienced programmers as uh, you can achieve the same, the same things that you would do with, with C or C++ but we now really having to take the, the risks uh, of memory management. So all this, in my opinion, makes, it, uh, uh, makes Rust a very good alternative to, to C or C++ to write uh, Python extensions. So we're going to see some code in a moment, but uh, just to recap so far, remember what, what we're trying to do is uh, write the Python extensions in order to optimize our code, to, to make it faster. So we, uh, in order to illustrate this, this point, I want to use a, a small example, a very short sample. So um, let's say we have a requirement that uh, we need to determine if the contents of a, of a certain file is form of only white spaces. So let, let, let's try doing a a very naive implementation in, in Python. Uh, we take the, the first argument as a, uh, as a file path, we open that file, and we iterate over each of the characters of, of the content. And 
we try to determine if it's if it's false or SF, if it's a white space or not, and uh, we return false immediately once we we encounter something that is not the white space. So this is again a very very naive implementation, very as simple as I, as it gets. So, but you know, for the sake of arg argument, bear with me. Uh, we're gonna see how it does in a benchmark. So we are testing here with uh, an input of 100 megabyte file, uh, which is filled with the uh, white spaces. And not surprisingly, it takes 2.5 seconds to, to run. So we can do much better. Let's try now with the, with the regular expression implementation, in, in, again, in Python this time. And simple implementation, very small, one line, we match uh, the contents of the file against uh, a regular expression that searches for, uh, for white spaces. So running it through, through the, the, same, uh, the same benchmark, we take the, the, input, the same input file of 100 megabytes. And this time we do much better, just a little bit north of uh, half a second. But uh, we still have customer waiting for, uh, for a response, so we need to do better than this. This is not up to the requirements. So let's try now with, the, with Rust. So this is the first slide you see some Rust code. This is very similar to, the, the syntax is very, uh, very similar to C, uh, uh, sorry, to C++. Um, so, we are new to Rust, so let's just try doing the, the implementation in the most naive way we, we can. You see the, the first line is the, the, um, the signature of the function. We take a string, which is the file path, and we return uh, a Boolean. That's the, the Boolean type. The first three lines there, the, the first three lines there, all, uh, they only deal with the opening the file and and loading the file constants into a buffer, a string uh, object in this case. So the, the last line is the actual logic in order to determine our, uh, if, if the, the, the file is blank, we take all the characters in the string and we, we iterate over each, each one of them, checking if it's a white space. We do this in a, in a closure. At, uh, once we encounter a non-white space a character we return immediately, otherwise we, we go over all the, all the characters in the string. So let's, let's see how this implementation does against the, compare with the Python implementation. In our, we're gonna ask, do question at the end, sorry. Uh, so let's try, uh, let's try this implementation with the, the benchmark. And uh, again, same, same input as, uh, uh, as before. We have uh, 100 megabyte files with white spaces. And this time, the, the, the Rust naive implementation does five times better. Uh, this is an average than the Python implementation with the, the regex one. And we see that it does 20 times better than the, uh, the naive Python implementation, which is very similar. So the amazing thing here is that we, we achieved uh, this uh, improvement without really putting any effort in, uh, in optimizing the, the implementation. And we ended up with a very easy to understand uh, and readable code. This is important because this means it's, it's very maintainable. So I want you to think that, uh, about that for a second. You, you take the most naive implementation you can come up with, and it is immediately uh, uh, very performant. Again, this is a, a very simple example and convoluted one, uh, uh, but the idea is to illustrate that, that point. Uh, it is, of course, not going to be that, uh, like that always. So. This is basically uh, very nice, but that's not the whole, the whole picture. We still need to be able to, to call Rust from Python in order to, so in order to use this Rust code, we need, we need to do some work uh, and let's see how that goes. So 
roughly in order uh, in order to create Python extensions, the the process is uh, three steps. You uh, in Rust is very similar to other languages. You expose a function in the in the Rust source code, then you instruct the toolchain to build a dynamic library that would be a, a shared object in a Unis bake system or a DLL in, in Windows. And then you load the, that dynamic library in, uh, from Python and you call the expose function. So in Python, if you're familiar, you can use the, the Python package called uh, uh, CFFI to, to load the dynamic library. And this description, I mean, it's a little hand wavy and it is obviously more complicated and, and, and involved than, than this. The, but uh, luckily, a few months ago, somebody created a very nice, uh, n n very r nice tool called uh, PyO3, which helps us do the bridge between Python and Rust. So we can see how that, uh, uh, that can be set up. So here we have the entire, uh, the entire Rust source code. I, I just removed the, the first three lines dealing with the opening the file, and I remove also the, some of the import statements that we need, just in order to fit the slide. So um, here we need to add uh, a few annotations and a few lines just to tell PyO3 what needs to be done. The first line on top is, the, is turning on certain Rust features that PyO3 needs. And the second, the second line is creating the bindings for, for the generated uh, dynamic library. Uh, this is the name that we will use later on to, to build the library. And lastly, uh, we expose the function with the PyFN uh, annotation. And PyO3 deals, uh, handles all the conversion from uh, Python types into Rust types and the other way around. So then, then we have this uh, settings file. This is for the for Cargo, which is the the build tool and the, and the package manager in in Rust. So we just need to add a few a few lines to this the settings files. We indicate that one of the our dependencies is the this PyO3 library. We then set the the library name. Uh, and we indicate the, the toolchain that this is going to be a dynamic library. So that's all we need to need to do on the Rust side. But uh, on the, so going back to the Python side, uh, in order to build the package, we can use uh, setup tools. We have an extension uh, that can help us with this. It is called Setup Tools Rust. Is by the same author of uh, PyO3. And this is a, also a very simple process. This is a standard setup UI uh, uh, fi uh, file. You export the, this Rust extension class and you declare what is, this, what is your uh, dynamic library and what is your uh, cargo settings. That's the, the, the file which we just saw. And uh, then this, uh, this extension is, uh, takes control, and when you run Python setup UI build, it, it goes and calls the, the Rust toolchain and compiles via this toolchain the, the actual library. Then uh, the usual standard stuff of uh, setup tools, they take, we take the, all the source codes and we bundle it into a Python package. And the steep safe falls there is uh, really nothing special to Rust. You can you need to do so uh, on the, when writing Python extensions also in other languages. So after after you run after you run setup UI installed, you will be able to to then import this uh, this Rust code from Python. Simply uh, simple similar uh, import, uh, uh, the same as you do with the. Uh, other extensions. So, as you can see, this is a really very, very little effort just in order to, to call Rust from Python, and that effort is very worthwhile in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of performance. So, to me, it's a very, uh, a very viable option. 
So uh, using Rust was really perfect fit for our use case. We ended up uh, increasing our performance 30 times in the best case. Um, but the good news, uh, at least for us, is that we we still have plenty of room for optimizations. Uh, we didn't started hacking right at the beginning, and we immediately gained performance. Uh, we also did this in a very productive way, thanks to the the high level nature of Rust. I mean, uh, the abstractions that that you get it also gives you gives you the ability to to develop very fast. We also did it with confidence. Uh, the confidence that the, the Rust language guarant gives you in, in memory safety, so we know we, we won't be facing any, any crashes or memory issues when, when deploying to production. We also may ended up with a very, very maintainable code, easy, easy to write code, easy, uh, easy to, to read code, and uh, a very, very maintainable code base. And we also had very, very f a lot of fun doing it. I mean, uh, language on uh, the language on top of being very very pleasant to work with the the, the tool set is is very very nice very polished and, and modern which is very uh, very nice to work with so i mean i, I wanna i wanna end up for being uh, giving you some call for actions uh, i encourage you to to give rust a look i mean if even if you don't end up doing uh, using it in your day-to-day day-to-day uh, -day job or uh, as your main language you're gonna be learning new uh, very interesting ideas that the that rust uh, has especially around concurrency so uh, try to detect bottlenecks in in your code base those maybe are candidates for uh, to write a pantheon extension and if you are at the point that you are considering writing a python extension definitely uh, give Rust a chance, put it in, the, in your process of uh, evaluation. So I have a few slides to the, some of the projects I, I mentioned, also the, the example that, that, I, that I created. You can take it as a base on how to, uh, how to create Python modules uh, with Rust. Um, okay, Anna, and that's it. I wanted to leave some time for for questions from the council. Yeah. I love Rust. It is a great language. Uh, but uh, why did you choose it over other solutions like a Cyclone or something that is more closely, uh, more closely resembles Python and easier for your developers? OK. So um, Cyclone wasn't, wasn't really one of the options that uh, we evaluated. I mean, from my experience with Cyton, the what, what you have is uh, a code base that end up, end up looking very much as Python. That's that's true, and, and we and we and we wanted to save Python. But uh, when we started optimizing for our use case, the the Python code wasn't really up to standard. Maybe it was uh, our fault, and uh, so maybe we with Cyton we would have ended up with the same sort of issues and. Um, I don't know. It, it really wasn't uh, some of the. It was. It wasn't really an option. But I know that's a good point. Maybe uh, maybe Cyton is a really good option as well. Yeah. What was their use of this mostly? So the the use of the library was um, yes, basically getting big big chunks of uh, of strings. So uh, the strings is uh, DNA and passing it over uh, biological algorithms. So determining if, if a certain sequence can actually be produced. There are a lot of uh, um, constraints in, on, in, at the low level of chemistry, thermodynamics that you need to be aware of in order to be able to produce. So ma mainly biological algorithms that, uh, uh, that deal with, uh, with Understanding if a, if a sequence, a DNA sequence, is, uh, we, can, uh, we are able to produce it, to print it. Yes? How do you decide uh, which code is uh, meant to be written in Python and which uh, is Rust? Is it Python just the front end of the. Yes, so, yeah, that's, that's a really very difficult question. I mean, 
basically you need to you need to to evaluate a, a, each case. So what we did in the, in our case, we we started doing proof of concept. So trying to understand uh, if it's even a, a viable solution. So what we discover for uh, from our experience is that immediately it, it yielded results. So without uh, leading, uh, started doing optimization just by porting to Rust, we gain uh, immediate uh, good results. But uh, you need to be aware of your specific use case. Sometimes you can, uh, you can think that, okay, maybe I just port this Python code to Rust and you won't be gaining any, uh, any speed whatsoever because you're hitting a path in Python that is actually implemented in a native C code. So the game won't be, won't be noticeable. So uh, it's, a, it's a process of learning your, 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 your own code and uh, understanding what it's doing and maybe trying and doing proof of concept. So it's not an easy way to, uh, not, not easy to, to answer. If you live in Python? Um, uh, if we use parallelism that we didn't uh, use in Python. No, uh, I mean, we, we had the uh, in Python parallel code, but um, what we ended up with is the much easier to understand implementation that uh, uh, for some reason in Python, you, in, in, in Rust, I, I mean, you still have, uh, have to deal, you have different ways to, to deal with the concurrency and par parallelism in Rust. You have channels where you communicate uh, uh, via messages within process, you have threads. And you so if you go the thread way, you still have the same uh, issues with mutexes and stuff like that. But uh, in the end, it, it ended up uh, being a much readable code. Uh, that's not to say like, like you can do very nice, readable, and parallel, uh, parallel code in Python, um, but uh, that, that was our experience. Yes? Uh, one thing I wasn't clear about uh, is uh, the, uh, about the uh, setup uh, dot file integration. I noticed yes. that you had a reference to the power of the file, so like the, uh, the project file. So is it right to, to assume that when you're running setup pi, you, you are also compiling? Correct. Exactly. So that is what the yes. So when when we run setup py install, if that is going to run also the the compilation of the library, that's the question, right? So yes, yeah, exactly. So what this uh, setup tools Rust extension does is uh, automating that process. So you can do that manually, like you can go and uh, execute the the Rust toolchain and you know compile yourself the library and then you just take that shared object which is the output and put it in your python uh, package so setup rules setup tool extension does all that for you automatically yes uh, if you run a setup py develop does it uh, setup py develop develop instead of uh, install does it uh, have any other effect than install or just I mean, what, what do you mean? Like, uh, if if you're able to to run the setup UI while you're developing? Yes. So during development, you you the the way you you develop in Rust, you every time you need you, you make a change, you of course you need to compile, right? So uh, in order for that code to to take place in your in a, in your uh, package, so. Um, the way you, you, you do it, if uh, uh, we do it automatically, detect any change in the code, and, and we run uh, the compilation, and then it's readily usable during uh, on your development environment. Yes. Um, so in, in, I know that in C, in C like that, you can use native uh, like and kind of What happens with Rust? Is there a function there, or can you just use the integer? So I'm not. I'm not really sure about that. But uh, so, yeah. So uh, what happens with the 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 types? Uh, and you can. And if you can pass that around types uh, uh, specifically from Python to Rust, that, that's the question. Right? So 
Uh, I didn't delve into to the details of that. I mean, Pio3 did, really does the, a good job on, on uh, passing around uh, uh, all, the, all the types and you know, converting them. So, but having said that, we, in our use case, we really do a very simple implementation where we pass around strings. So we didn't de dealt with the complex data types. So uh, mainly pass around strings. So it's uh, easier. Thank you very much. <laughs>